is infiltrated, something is stored. So if you want to compute the surface runoff, it's clear that you have to subtract something from rainfall. Okay? So now let's see if uh, the second and the third term combined gives back a quantity that is subtracted from rainfall. And uh, so I think this is really true because if you look at uh, this term here, Pt is uh, lower than C max, which means that this term here is lower than 1. So you add something that is lower than C max divided beta plus 1, and then you subtract C max divided beta plus 1, which is higher, which means this term here is higher than this one. So that's fine. I mean, this relationship gives back to you the cumulative rainfall minus something. Minus something, as far as uh, the basin is not, the catchment is not saturated. So until P is lower than C max. So this is fine. I mean, this relationship from a physical point of view is uh, justified. Perfect. And now we can uh, we could ask ourselves what is uh, the amount of uh, the volume of water that is stored in the kitchen. So if we indicated with uh, WT the volume of water that is stored in the catchment, what is the amount of such volume of water? I would say that this is quite easy to compute because uh, WT, volume of water stored in the catchment at time t star, is given by cumulative rainfall at time t star minus this quantity here. So basically, it's given by P t star minus p t star and just subtracting from here minus I'm changing signs minus c max divided by beta plus one times one minus p t star divided c max to the power of beta plus C max beta plus divided by beta plus one. <coughs> and then we see that these one these ones cancel each other, they cancel out. So I get this relationship here. Is that minus? There is a minus here. So this is plus, and you know, I couldn't uh, put minus again here because the minus times minus gives, gives plus. So the correct way of writing this is minus and plus in the line below. You understand? This is a minus, by the way. Mm -hmm. If I had written on the same line, it would be just a minus, okay? Now let me re rewrite it because we can also now uh, we can also isolate C max divided beta plus one and then we can write it in, in this way. So basically we can write it W V star is equal to C max divided beta plus 1 and this multiplies 1 minus 1 
minus p t star divided c max to the power of theta plus 1. This is uh, the storage in the catchment. Remember that this works uh, as long as you neglect evapotranspiration and as long as uh, precipitation, cumulative precipitation is lower than C max. Otherwise, it doesn't work if you if you think of this relationship with the precipitation higher than C max, it doesn't work. <coughs> now, uh, an interesting question would be what is uh, the maximum water storage into the catchment? So, what is the maximum value of W? The maximum value of W, of course, it's richer than when the catchment is full of water, when it's saturated. And therefore, you should equate uh, precipitation to Cmax. In order to get the maximum storage, we need to equate, to put the condition P T star is equal to Cmax. It's the limiting condition for applying this relationship. And if you do that, you get that W max is simply equal to Cmax divided beta plus 1. And look, this relationship is, is fully meaningful because uh, you see that the W max uh, is always uh, lower or at most equal to C max. If you have beta equal to zero, then you get W max equal to C max, which is reasonable from a physical point of view. But if you get beta, higher than zero, then this is a reductive relationship. It's reducing the amount of the storage, which is perfectly fine. Because if C max is the maximum water storage, it means that there are areas in the catchment which have a more limited water storage. And therefore, they cannot store up to C max. And therefore, the maximum storage in the catchment should be lower than C max because there is only one location in the catchment that can store C max. The other location can store less. So this is meaningful. And it's also important for us to know what is the maximum storage into the catchment. Now, this integration that they did, it's explained in these uh, pictures and uh, in these slides. And I think that the symbols should be I hope they are coherent with what I used in the blackboard, but I would say yes. And basically, uh, the only difference is that I started from computing the W instead of starting from computing the surface runoff. And then, basically, I developed the, the um, integration starting from W because uh, this is uh, a unique treatment. I mean, in my, in my treatment, I first computed the surface runoff and then W. Here, I directly computed W. And uh, you see that here you have all the steps towards integration, and at the end of the story, you get the same relationship that I got here. So if, if the, uh, the equation ends to minus, then we're talking about drought, right? Sorry, the equation ends? If WT equates to minus, then we're talking about drop. Uh, minus, uh, you mean the minus that? Yeah, if the total work, the, the, if the volume of water is still in the catchment. Yes. If it goes to minus. No, the, it cannot go to minus. Because uh, the amount of water stored in the catchment, how can it get uh, lower than zero? Only if beta is lower than minus one, but beta by definition is positive. Maybe that I didn't explain that, I didn't say that explicitly. I, but when I show to you the different curves, the shapes of the different curves, uh, I started from beta tending to zero, and I went up to beta tending to infinity. 
So beta is positive. Did I reply to your question? Okay, yeah. fine. And so uh, probably I didn't say that explicitly. I, if you take beta negative, uh, it, it is not meaningful this relationship here. So it's uh, I, I implicitly assumed that it's clear that it's positive, but or positive or zero. But uh, indeed, if you think that this relationship with a negative value is not meaningful, and also this one, everything doesn't make sense. And also it doesn't make sense, again, if you get a rainfall that is higher than C max, it doesn't make sense. Okay, now, what can we do up to now? Up to now we can compute at each time step the cumulative storage into the catchment and the cumulative surface, the cumulative volume of surface runoff. So volume of, uh, I could drop cumulative. Because if I speak of volume, I could drop cumulative. I, I'm getting the volume of water stored into the catchment and the volume of surface along at each time step. Now, it's uh, clear that once that you know these two numbers at each time step, you can compute at each time step the river flow and by taking the derivative of the volume. But now, let, let me explain how, from a numerical point of view, we can move forward. Okay? So from a numerical point of view, so let me explain how we can write an algorithm now at the PC that moves, moves uh, forward from here. Now, let's suppose that, uh, don't look at the slide for now, just look at the blackboard. I'm making it simpler. suppose that we want to compute the river discharge at time t star. And uh, instead of saying river discharge, I do prefer to say the flow of surface runoff. Because, uh, you know, one thing is the production of water along the hill slopes. One other thing, uh, so one thing is uh, the water flow along the hill slopes. One other thing is uh, the river, the flow in the river. You need uh, some time from the hill slopes to get to the river. So I would prefer for now to call it uh, as uh, the water flow along the hill slopes, uh, okay? Because uh, we, we need uh, to add something if we want to transfer these volumes to the river. And we will see in uh, 10 minutes how to do that. But now, let me compute the flow of the produced surface runoff over the hill slopes. And therefore, what we can do, it's uh, do it like this. So basically, we could uh, uh, compute, or let me say, um, because uh, with the finite difference, let, let me introduce another, uh, a more uh, detailed uh, a more detailed uh, uh, notation because uh, basically what we have to do, let me say Q times T star plus one because uh, I, I cannot refer to a fixed time, I need to refer to a time step. So basically this is given by rainfall at time T star plus one minus a rainfall at time t star at the same line. I, I went, it was just my mistake that I moved a bit up there. And uh, basically, what is this? It, the difference between uh, the cumulative rainfall at time step t star plus one minus the cumulative rainfall at time t star. So it's uh, a difference in cumulative rainfall, which means that it's rainfall that fell in the given time step. And uh, this is certainly higher than the flow, the flow of surface runoff. Why it's higher? Because part of it gets stored into the catchment. So basically what we have to do is to subtract to it what should we subtract. 
the difference between the storage at time to star plus one minus storage at time to star. This is what you see here, which is called with another symbol. It's called uh, this ER2. Mm. We will see why. And uh, basically, you see difference between uh, cumulative rainfall minus difference between cumulative volumes. Okay, fine. And then what happens uh, now? We have to introduce. Uh, a second relationship to be applied if uh, you have rainfall exceeding the Cmax. At this stage, we, we can apply this relationship, which means uh, that you are computing the runoff that is produced uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, rainfall is lower than Cmax, now we have to introduce another relationship. What happens if, uh, because why should we introduce another relationship? Because we cannot apply this one if we get to a situation in which uh, cumulative rainfall is higher than Cmax. I already told you this relationship which I obtained by integration can be applied only if cumulative rainfall is lower than Cmax. And what happens then if I get at a level that is higher than Cmax, it simply happens that the storage doesn't change, and therefore you compute the contribution to the surface runoff as difference among the rainfalls. Everything rains, it's produced as surface runoff. So basically, you have two relationships. One that can be applied if you get to a stage where cumulative rainfall is lower than Cmax, and the other one that should be applied if uh, you get to a stage where rainfall is higher than Cmax. So basically, you forget the second until you reach your cumulative rainfall a value of Cmax, and then you forget the first when you get to saturation. OK. So basically, this is what we have to do. So it starts rain. I use this relationship here until uh, the amount of rainfall is uh, equal to Cmax. And then I turn to the other relationship that you see there. And now I'm still missing something. So I removed one of my first assumptions, because uh, uh, you may remember that I, I took two assumptions. First, that there is no evapotranspiration. Second, that I have a rainfall that is lower than Cmax. Now, by introducing this relationship, I remove the second assumption. And now let me remove. Uh, we still have to remove the first. We have to compute evapotranspiration. And then at this stage, we have to invent something. So, so far, what are we able to do? We are able to compute the surface runoff, the volume of surface runoff without accounting for evapotranspiration. So first of all, what is evapotranspiration? It's a water loss that is uh, lost by the catchment. So it, the catchment storage that is uh, reduced by this phenomenon that is evapotranspiration, which is direct evaporation plus transpiration from vegetation. So basically, you have this catchment storage, WT, which is reduced by the sum of these two phenomena, evaporation and transpiration. They are usually, when, when we model them, they are usually modeled together. Because uh, uh, this is a process that is uh, modeled through empirical relationships. And therefore, uh, putting them together is just for the sake of obtaining uh, an empirical relationship which is easier to apply. So at present, uh, we don't have uh, physical models that can describe uh, these uh, two processes independently. 
in detail, especially transpiration, as you may understand, it's quite complicated to model. It depends on several factors, uh, temperature, vegetation type, season, uh, wind speed, uh, soil type. Uh, it's a process that even in the lab, even for very small plots, uh, you cannot model uh, with uh, a physical relationship. Evaporation, you can do that because, uh, of course, you can write physical laws uh, for modeling evaporation. Still, they are affected by uncertainty because the wind speed is described with uncertainty, but you could be the physical model for evapor evaporation. For transpiration, really, it's not possible. So the way that we follow in hydrology is to use empirical relationships. And uh, these empirical relationships, this is not explained here because I'm not focusing much on evapotranspiration in this course because uh, Focusing on it would just uh, imply that they give you empirical laws. But I think that uh, I need to clarify the essence of uh, how evapotranspiration is modeled. So basically, there are empirical relationships of different level of complexity. Different level of complexity, why? Because depending on the amount of information that you have, uh, you can apply a more detailed relationship. So the literature proposed several empirical relationships for giving to you what? What is called potential evapotranspiration, which means the maximum value that you may get. So this empirical relationship, again, give to you the potential evapotranspiration which is the upper value that you may get. You may ask me when this upper value occurs. And in brief, I would say when you have unlimited water availability. So let me make an example. If you go in the middle of the desert of Sahara, you have a very huge potential of transpiration, but you don't have any effective evapotranspiration because there is no water. If you had unlimited water available, then you would have the effective evapotranspiration equal to the potential evapotranspiration. So just learn these two terms, potential evapotranspiration, effective evapotranspiration. The empirical relationships gives to you give to you the potential one. Perfect. Now, how can we model evapotranspiration in high mode? Of course, uh, we may have uh, several different solutions. Now, I tell you what is the official solution that is adopted. But of course, uh, there you may invent other possibilities. First of all, let's suppose that we have an estimate of potential evapotranspiration. I'm not focusing, as I said, on empirical relationship for computing yield. So let's suppose that in some way you got an estimate of the potential evapotranspiration. The potential evapotranspiration, you can treat it like rainfall, like a rainfall. It's uh, the opposite of rainfall. So if you describe rainfall through the cumulative rainfall, so if Pt is your cumulative rainfall at time t, you can define potential evapotranspiration as in cumulative terms. Or you may define the potential evapotranspiration as evapotranspiration intensity, okay, which means cumulative divided by the considered time step. Usually, it is given in daily values, which means intensity. Usually, when we model in hydrology, we get rainfall in daily values or hourly values, which means intensity, because you see it as a length. But there is implicitly the time step. So if you say daily rainfall implicitly, you are saying daily, which means rainfall in one day. So if you see it as a number, and you wonder what is the unit, is millimeters per day if it is daily rainfall. Usually, the hydrographic service gives to you the rainfall in millimeters, and they say it's millimeters at daily time step. And one may say, okay, these are millimeters. No, it's millimeters 
divided by day. It's intensity. So basically, you can treat, as I said, evapotranspiration like rainfall. So usually, rainfall is given in millimeters per hour, millimeters per day, and evapotranspiration, the potential one, is given in millimeters per hour, millimeters per day. And very often, you may see that this potential evapotranspiration is slowly varying along the day and along the days, of course, because, you know, it depends, it's very smooth. The progress is very smooth. The progress is long time. So let's suppose that now we have these estimates of potential evapotranspiration, which is called, which is called EP, evapotranspiration potential at time t. Now, what happens in reality? It happens that if you have unlimited water, if the catchment is saturated, unlimited water means that the catchment is saturated, you may translate it in terms of saturation of the catchment. So if you have unlimited water and you have the catchment full of water, basically, the effective evapotranspiration equates is the same as the potential evapotranspiration. Fine. But if you have zero water in the catchment, of course your effective evapotranspiration should be zero. And between these two extremes, you may devise your preferred progress. What I would say is it's to take a linear variation of effective evapotranspiration between zero and one linear variation depending on the catchment storage. And this is what you see here. So what is uh, C max divided beta plus one? It's the maximum storage. It's not here, but it's the maximum storage. So basically here you can read maximum storage minus actual storage divided by maximum storage. So this is uh, basically Something that if you equate the storage to its maximum, this fraction here becomes zero. And then the quantity between parentheses becomes one, and you see that ET is equal to EPT. Here ET is effective evapotranspiration. Conversely, if you take a zero, a zero value for WT, then you get here 1 minus 1, which is 0, and the effective evapotranspiration is 0. And between these two extremes, you have a linear variation depending on W. I mean, this is easy. If you take this model for true, to make this computation is very easy, because you know how to compute at each time step W. And you need to compute W for computing your surface runoff. So it's fine. I mean, at each time step, I can compute also according to this model. And provided I have the estimates of EP, I can compute according to this model my effective UV transpiration. Fine. And now, what should I do with this estimate? I should subtract it from the storage. And what you see here, you see that the storage is penalized by subtracting the effective evapotranspiration. Now, basically, what I do then at each time step at each time step, I look at rainfall, I compute P. By knowing P, by using the relationship that was written here before, I can compute W. And I know, I remember the computation of P and W at the previous time step. So I can compute Q which is, again, remember, surface runoff produced over the catchment. And then, by knowing 
But for you, I can compute the evapotranspiration and then I can compute the new value of W. You see that this is a new value. I put it a star, meaning that it's a new value. And then I move forward with the next time step. And of course, you may, you may ask me, but why didn't you remove evapotranspiration be before computing the runoff? This would be a very legitimate question. If you said, in, what, in which order do you compute the surface runoff and in which order you update the volume stored in the catchment? Because I could update the volume before computing the surface runoff. And I would obtain a different result. This is the numerical approximation. This is the error that is induced by the numerical approximation. If you have a time step that is close to zero, of course, it doesn't make a difference which order you use, because the changes in the volume and rainfall are so small that it doesn't matter if you update it before computing the surface runoff or not. When the time step has a finite value, this is the effect of numerical approximation. It is a matter of your preference. If you prefer to overestimate the surface runoff, or you want to underestimate it. Because basically, if you subtract evapotranspiration first, then you underestimate the surface runoff, etc. OK, now we have a final step to make. Because what I uh, estimated here, if, uh, as I said, the surface runoff produces over the catchment, let's now transfer it to the river. And, uh, and then I enter into the second part of this sketch. You see storage is there. So let me explain what is done here. Let me see if it is done in the next slide. Uh, I don't think this is relevant. It's explained here. So basically, this volume that is produced over the catchment is split in two parts through a parameter alpha, which is comprised between 0 and 1. You see alpha indicated there. Alpha is a weight. It's comprised between 0 and 1, and it allows us to split the surface runoff in two components. You may say, you may ask me why it is done in this manner. From a physical point of view, we do that because we recognize that in nature, you may have a fast runoff and a slow runoff. And therefore, we want to consider separately these two components. From a practical point of view, from the modeler's perspective, this is done to introduce flexibility into the model. So we add a parameter and we divide the runoff into components because we want to have a more flexible approach. Then, one part is transferred to the river through a linear reservoir. So basically, you get the part of the surface runoff that gets into the lower layer entering into a linear reservoir which has its own uh, parameter Ks. And then the output from the linear reservoir it is assumed to be the slow runoff to the river. Perfect. The other part is routed through a cascade of three linear reservoirs with the same constant, probably it's not well visible here, but it's indicated as Qq and is the same for the three upper reservoirs. So basically, how many parameters this model has? Let, let's make a count. First of all, I introduced three parameters here. Alpha, Ks, and Kq. Three parameters. And alpha is a dimensional. Ks is one over time. And Kq is one over time. Are there other parameters? Yes. Beta and Cmax. Five.
and uh, we can easily understand that we can, we know how to model a linear reservoir, the bottom part, but we also know how to model three, a cascade of three linear reservoirs. We didn't do that, but it's clear that once that you know how to model one, you can also model a cascade of three. And we will see by developing the exercise how to write the algorithm in practice. And you will see that it's a very simple algorithm. <coughs> And now, please notice that there are five parameters that we need to calibrate. In the linear reservoir, the exercise that you did last week, you had one. Here we have five parameters. Now, I close this lecture by saying, look, in, in this subject that we are in this trip that we are taking together, in the subject, I would say that there are three topics that are a bit complicated to understand. I would say that this one probably is the, the more, most challenging one. So I say this because I understand that you may have some problems uh, now in realizing if you really got what I said. And, uh, if you have some doubts, it means that you are a good student because it's uh, you know it's impossible in two hours to fully get how this model works. You need to uh, to relax a bit and to look back at it, and I am confident that you may understand it. But still, I I, I recognize that this is a bit challenging. And uh, your question could be, do you ask this question at the exam? And my reply is yes, if you look well prepared. It's very difficult that I start. With, I don't start with the first question asking, uh, please tell me about the IMO model. Usually I start for, from, for instance, the linear reservoir, and then if I see that.